So moving along the thread of what's good for you, um, the next presentation concerns the bean, green bean production. And it's effectively a data to decision support project featuring Australian food production company Mulgawi concerning green bean production, as I mentioned. The team's led by Professor Paul Corey at Queensland University of Technology and Amanda Woods at Mulgawi. And it will be presented by a key researcher in the project, Associate Professor Miranda Mortlock, also from the Queensland University of Technology. The project exists to improve alignment between Mulgawi's green bean sales and production plans in order to better match supply with demand. The goal is to increase bean profits by a substantial amount, not only for the company, but also more broadly for the industry. So it's great to see you again, Miranda. Welcome back. And, uh, and look forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Fantastic. I'm just going to share my screen now, everybody. Thank you. I hope you can see that. Can you see it yet? Looking good. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, yes, I'm very happy to be back, everybody. And I'd first like to recognise uh, the Jagera and Tubal people who um, are from Western Brisbane on the land on which I live and work. And I pay respects to them past, present and future. It's a beautiful part of the world. Um, now, my title here is May Not What You Saw on the, um, on the Original Schedule. I've called it Collaboration of Applied Researchers with Vegetable Producers to Use Data su to Support Decisions. And uh, there is a reason for that, which I um, will explain. Oh. So the outline that I'm going to just, can you see that as well? Okay. Um, my outline for this project is we're in a deep dive on this, so I'm going to be talking in fairly generalities, uh, and I've tried to excite you about the skills and the strategies we've used, and I will highlight the project characteristics and uh, give you a few reality checks and aspirations. Now, this little picture in the corner here is to remind me, I noticed with uh, Carol earlier on, she had a reminder, this is because I've been sick for a few months, so that's why um, I'm very happy to do this, but we are not... Um, we haven't finished the project, they'll be finished next year. So what do we bring to the project? We're bringing statistical methodology, uh, including sampling and using st in particular statistical modeling. We are bringing um, in particular the context, the agronomy, the crop phen phenology, the yield, the growing environment and the management. The crop modeling is building on all of the above. And the nice thing with this is we're using technology transfer to get it in the art. Um, arms of the producer. And what we're dealing with here is not only beans, but we're dealing with high quality vegetables. Um, our focus has been on predictive modeling for beans, but we're looking here with various sites, seasons, we've got historic data, and our yield is affected by genetic by environment by management, which is what agronomists know as G by E by M, and, and the particular modelers know that terminology. So what our question is, can we use models for prediction of production incorporating agrometeorological variables. I'll just give us a quick dive into statistical methods to remind us how useful they are. They are actually not a black box. A, there's a big, um, uh, based on theory, and we've got variation we love. We actually value variation in our, um, in our studies. So we've got natural variation, which might be the genetics, the variety, the environment, how deep's the rooting, and the management, you know, what time of year we planted it. Some of our explanatory variations are confounded. So we might have deep roots, so therefore it's got good water holding capacity, or we might be on a sunny slope, so we get better radiation. Now, statistical methods involve sampling errors where the larger the sample, we get more precision. And sampling itself is a whole theory where we actually do random sampling and we avoid bias. And the non-sampling error is where we do have biases. And often this is where statistics and statisticians can assist. So it allows us to estimate means or proportions and an uncertainty of that estimate. So what we're looking at here is, and I didn't have this up before, but um, we've got whether something is accurate and precise, like hit the bullseye, whether we've got a accurate but not precise, which is more variation here around the same bullseye. We might be really precise, but we're not actually accurate, <laughs> or we might be 
neither precise or accurate. Now, what statistics does, it helps us with both of these. We can define our precision and we can usually become more accurate. And just here I've got, it uh, doesn't really matter what this is in particular, but it is an example from um, a project where we had some data, we're looking at observed data collected by an agronomist, or if you like, the people in the field, they're not research agronomists, that's fine. And these, this is you know, applying a statistical model. And what we're really looking at here is we've got a red line where we're looking to see what is the difference between that model or that estimate and our real if you like the true mean and you can see when you use a statistical model you're very close to our true mean we don't have a difference but the the variance here is just probably about the same the variance is this box which is unicortile interquartile range and they are similar but we, we we are expecting variation we're looking at biology so that's okay so here what we've shown is that statistics can actually improve our modeling and we hope that we can bring that to it but the other thing that's really important is our research question, which is our raison d'etre for the research group and the challenge, the starting point. And this requires a certain amount of skills and building a team. We've usually got data. That's the lovely thing about these projects. We have to have a time frame which does constrain us. And then we have to look at methods. And so for our research question here, as I said, we're looking at can we use our existing historic, sorry about the spelling there, historic data to develop models for prediction of production incorporating agro meteorological variables. So the idea is to bring in our net data, our meteorological data that is freely available or open access. So here, um, when we look at methods, I've put this in brackets because I've noticed a few other uh, projects today have mentioned these things. We have to deal with things like software. Who's using R? Who's using Python? Where's the data coming? Is it Excel? Hat? Is it from um, SAP? We've got to look at data handling, the interoperability of systems. And in particular for us, we're going to move into app development, which might not be something we've all worked with before. So what we're doing here on many, many of our projects, and I think this really is across all of our uh, agricultural projects in food agility, we've got, for instance, crop science or animal science. We've got our crop modeling and we've got our statistics. We've got this big body of knowledge and we can tap into this and build on it for our future innovation. So our project arises out the fact that we believe we can do something better. And why is that? Because we've got this amazing body of knowledge and we've also got new technology. We've got this, um, you know, use of mobile phones for apps our technology has changed and so you can see we're going to reach up to that castle in the sky with a beanstalk and try different potential approaches so uh, when people talk about old research this is a really old thing from one of my papers but what i just want to show you here is that if you're looking at um and this is actually sorghum no sorry pearl millet um uh, germination so the rate of germination which is measured as um the rate to 50 percent uh germination it's a rate. So we're just looking at something that's happening. It could be leaf growth. It could be pod growth. It could be, you know, cob growth, whatever. And you often see a typical example where you've got this temperature response. So it goes up to some sort of optimum here. It's quite high optimum because it's a tropical crop. And then it trails off. And then you probably have sort of a maximum where you're not going to get much growth. So what we're saying here is that we're interested in temperature. We're interested in the rate of development, which actually drives the phenology. The phenology is how a crop goes from stage to stage. It, for, for a bean, for instance, it goes to petal fall, the nodes develop, and it starts pod development. So when we're developing this research question, um, and we've decided that we need to do something better, we've got all of this data, and we're coming into building some efficiency. And this is where I see Food Agility has really had a role to kickstart these projects. So it's got the scope, scoping has happened and it creates the dream team. In this case, it's QUT and we've got Malgawi and we've got um, DAF uh, and Food Agility. Um, I haven't run this talk by Mulgawi, so that's why I haven't actually got any specifics from Mulgawi, but next year we'll be showing you all of that. So where does the magic happen? This is where I think, and it is my Eureka moment, by the way, uh, David. <laughs> so we've got the context and the research question. So that's where that comes in. We've talked about that a couple of times. The grower, the producer has many sites and has decisions to make. He wants to make better decisions. He wants to plant at a better time. He wants to harvest at the best time. And then we've got this whole body of data, this applied research data, and we've got the knowledge of the crop, the weather, historic, and we've got some constraints. And we've got the whole body of our agronomy measures. We've got those journals that only a few of us go into those dusty archives and read, but we, we're aware of the agronomy, the crop science and so on. And then from this, you can see all these little fleeting arrows, the models are developed 
And for this, we require really well-defined data and we require it to be available. And this is, can be one of our, um, not issues, a challenge. So we're, we're developing this model and then we're hoping that it's so fantastic that it feeds up and helps our, our grower. So this is where the magic happens, in my opinion. This is where the Eureka, where all of this body of knowledge, skills, teams comes together. So what we've done in this case, we've got the data. Some of the data is actually commercial, if you like, from the producer, and some is derived data. The derived data um, um, is what we're going to be pulling in from the um, weather data, if you like. At the moment, we used, um, or in the first instance, we used data from the silo, which is a Queensland um, uh, site that has really good, cleaned, ag agronomically relevant uh, weather data. So what we needed, for instance, was some type of agrometeorological variables. We wanted thermal time. And as I said, when I was talking about my millet, um, you know, showing the rate of development, we, with, when we're looking at crops, we're looking at thermal time or growing degree days. We're not necessarily looking at days the way that we see it as human. And often you need something like a base temperature or a capped temperature. And for beans, we find that the best base is five degrees because uh, it's a warm temperate crop and the max capped at 30. So we use things like our average mean dailies, our average max, our minimum dailies, average daily radiation, um, evaporation, um, potentially, or vapor, uh, vapor pressure, which is some idea of the sort of the demand of the environment for the water of the crop and cumulative day, daily radiation. Now, what we expected with this is that our, um, because we've got a well-watered crop, the most important thing would be about the stress temperatures or adequate you know optimum temperatures and our radiation interception so you need the crop to be um, absorbing or you know intercepting the radiation to produce the sugars to produce the pods and the other thing we've done in this project which is nice we've got an innovation and a legacy we've developed an R package called the crop grow days because we needed to do so many of this uh, derived data that we've come up with a package which is freely available for those who are interested so some of the derived data don't worry too much about the details, but I can just tell you, for instance, we, we can calculate grain degree days, five degree base from um, post sowing 14 days. So we, whatever period of time we want to, we can produce a variable and we're using this nice R code, which is, um, as I said, uh, available. And this helps us to get our derived weather variables. So then what we're actually doing is we're looking at iterative modeling. Um, so we had the historic yield data and in fact we had the growing seasons as well, so we had like time to plentiful, um, time to harvest and uh, different seasons, different sites and so on, and the estimated yields, and then we had our previous, um, all these variables, sorry, kind of back up, some of these variables, um, and then we, so we've got the past sowings, we've got our historic weather, and what we're doing at the top here, we're just trying to work out what can we use to help us predict our candidate models for things like uh, total growing season, yield, um, and time to harvest and so on, or uh, petal fall to harvest. And then what we're doing, we're at a stage now, we're sort of in this yellow area where we've got some really nice uh, models and we're using them for predictions and we're taking some typical past data because we've worked out which or more or less, which uh, variables we're keen on. And then we're coming to these minimum verifiable product model, which will ultimately be some app, if you like. So we're refining, we're here at the moment, we're transferring it to an app uh, simultaneously, and then we're gonna use it and we're hoping to gain efficiency for uh, the producers. So the expectation is what is possible. Uh, sometimes we get set milestones by food agility. Uh, and sometimes they're set before we've even got our hands dirty. So that's a challenge. But one of the things we really need to know is that data is our precious asset here. And we do need to have a really good idea of understanding what we can predict. So just for here, for instance, here, I've got just a, some examples of some candidate models. We're looking at vegetative growth. We've got high R squared. It was looking, um, or the predictors for that was radiation and grand degree days. Um, an alternate had stress days involved as well, but it got a slightly higher R squared. We've got our pod uh, growth period, which is from pedophile to vegetative, and that get, includes a season, because if you plant one end of the year compared to another end of the year, you get a different result. Um, and likewise for total, we did look at grain degree days with a 12 degree base, but we found that wasn't as useful as for the five degree base. Um, and I, I'm just showing you this. So we have tried a lot of variables. 
we had candidate variables, averages, cumulative stress days, and we actually produced them for each point of the year, each possible growing point of the year, so that we could match it with our particular actual observed growing, um, grow, uh, our actual sowings. And so this is what we use, and we're still um, in quite a dive with this. But what I wanted to say is the quantity of data is important. But sometimes what we think is a quantity of data is not as much as you think, because it's often very site specific, very contextual, based on a particular season. So we have to work out the quality of the data, and whether it's, whether it's fit for purpose. Um, the commercial data is amazing coming from um, the producers. But as other people have mentioned, sometimes there can be one or two um, problems with it, but not really problems, but just we've got to learn to work with each other. Uh, we've got publicly available data, which is sometimes really nicely available through um, an API or something like that. We're bringing together methods and skills from researchers. So myself, I'm more of an old fashioned researcher, um, if you like, uh, been in the game for a long time. And some of the younger ones um, know things a bit differently. So it's really nice to bring all these things together. We've got information systems people, we've got statisticians, and we're trying to bring together this powerful body of rigorous theory. And if it is truly research or applied research, then it hasn't been done before. And so even though you've got these expectations, you need to have the appreciation at the outset that even this applied research, there's no real path to certainty. And I think we all need to, I think those of us in research realise that, but sometimes people outside of research think you're going to straight down the track and you'll get there. There's no real guarantee, okay? But what we do in the meantime, we use trial and error, we use innovation, we tie up loose ends, you might go down a cul-de-sac, and we use this iterative modeling approach. So I'm just going back a little bit to the data. So what we did right at the beginning, we just defined what we were looking at. We've got a total green bean growing season, we've got a vegetative part, so there's planting and at petal fall. And then from petal fall to harvest, we've got the pod growth. So these were our little periods of growth. Um, and we had these mostly, mostly from um, real grow, real sowings over the last 15 years. So our data input to research was the vegetable production, which was the producers. And then we had this open access data, which is our MET data through the silo website. And sometimes there's this hidden data. And this is the sort of thing where maybe the producer expects us to use uh, something like um, soil depth or soil um, texture, but unless we have that for every single plot, we can't use it in our models. So we have to think about um, when we're modeling, we have uh, research has fairly precise de definitions and we probably need data. We don't want too much missing because we won't be able to use that. And of course, the other thing is this interoperability of databases. Some things are confounding such as soils, slopes, soil depths. Predictions, again, is a really big area of, of uh, statistical work, and everyone wants predictions. They're not that easy to do. It's easy to predict one or two days out, but if you go further out, week 14 days, it's a much, much harder. And as the further we go out, the less certain we are. So these are the, the um, constraints and the um, challenges. So in summary, I'd like to say that uh, we're collaborating along here with a win-win uh, outcome with Mulgawi, doing really nicely with them. It requires trust, good communication, um, and I think a well-defined research question is absolutely vital. Um, the data is important. We need to have well-described, cleaned, and we should totally value our data and then use it to our best of our ability. And we want to use a good reproducible method. The nice thing about being reproducible and having something like an R package that is available is that it hasn't got to be reinvented. There's no black box. We know what we're doing. You can see it flowing through the code. And the ability to be agile. Thank you, Food Agility. So our scientific outcomes um, will be that we require peer review outputs and using appropriate robust methods. And our industry outcomes will be that we will assist in allocation of sowing times, the timing of harvest, will reduce costs, hopefully, and improve efficiency. And this little bit down the bottom here, I'm just saying that we need to acknowledge, and this is one of the things we have to value and acknowledge the uncertainty of data, because it's a very important component for reporting of results in a scientific um, investigation. And as we add, as we use this model, as we uh, develop new, new uh, even if it's just using older methods on newer situations, we're adding to this body. We're building on the shoulders of giants with our new findings. And the other thing we need to do is use careful methodology because we can reduce uncertainty by correcting for this systematic error or bias. 
and minimizing random error, but we can never reduce that uncertainty to zero. And we don't really want to because that's part of our variability. So very finally, I would like to acknowledge in particular Food Agility, CRC, uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, Queensland, we had uh, Dr. David Kerry, I don't know if he's on here today, hello, if he is, and our QUT team led by um, Professor Paul Corrie, Associate Professor in Operations Research, and the producers in Lockyer Valley. And I really hope you'll all be along for next year because we will be telling you how the app went and uh, how the producers found it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Miranda. <laughs> An absolute whirlwind, but that's you and your passion totally. <laughs> about the approach to the modelling. Um, so you made the comment about, you know, you know, we're, we're generally dealing with a well-watered crop and you've got a whole raft of climate, you know, weather-based inputs, you know, growing degree days and derivative products like that that then get put into the thing. What about soil constraints? What about um, other things other than water? What's, what's the tactic and how does the model cope with those other constraints, whether they be known or unknown? Well, basically, that's a great question. And uh, I think if it was, I mean, we are, we are looking at an agile um, project with uh, producers. They didn't provide us with any specific, because we, we, our level of, um, our, if you like, our unit of study is a block, probably about one to two hectares. So we didn't really, we only had location in terms of lat longitude. Um, we didn't really have any source information. Not, we kept asking and they kept saying it was important, but we never really had any. So that was one of the constraints. And I, I noticed with the uh, avocado, the same sort of thing. Um, and this, this is learning to work together because sometimes they, they might know which blocks or sites are really good, but it's not captured in a database. So we don't actually have that, uh, David, but because what I'd say is because we, the assumption is it's a high value vegetable crop and it's well watered, I would also assume in most cases it's well fertilised. Okay, so if I, I just to make sure I understand, interpret this correct. So what I'm getting, what I'm guessing here is that you're reducing all of the parameters, the parameter sets, water, soil nutrition or soil related constraints, or you're, you're effectively eliminating them out. So really the only driver left are the things like solar illumination, growing degree days, that sort of deal. Is that, is that the tactic? Yeah, more or less. And, and to be honest, I, when I came into this project, um, you know, you never, you've always come in with a bit of an idea of what, it, what might be important. And it was confirmed that what's important is your interception of uh, radiation. And, uh, you know, the population of plants is important, but again, we don't even have population of plants. All we really had was sowing date, uh, petal fall date, which is when the beans start produce, you know, start, start developing. And we had the harvest date. Uh, we had, in fact, not much to go on really, but I think um, having said that, we had enough. So, okay, so, and, and I guess, I mean, you've got a bit of an early look, I'm, I'm assuming, of how the models are performing in the, given the conditions of the data that you've got at hand. Um, in a way, you've identified that as a gnarly challenge, you know, just the fact that you've got gaps in data, missing data, the whole deal, right, which is a, a common thread we're finding. <laughs> but again, so in terms of the resilience of your model and the experience you're bringing to bear on building this model, th there could be other, other causes, other constraints come to bear. How, how, will, how will the model speak to that? Or how, will you, how will the model tell you? I don't have enough. Is it simply that you can't converge when you're looking at the cow valve sort of data sets that you're going against? What's your, what's your experience tell you about the tactics? Well, I, I think um, in general, our models are performing quite well. Uh, most of the models are, have got an R squared of 0.75 and above, which is nice. And so that we can usually get down to one or two day, maybe up to three days for harvest total growing season. Now, before I went away, I went away for about three months of sick leave. And before I went away, I was focusing on one um, big area. And there's another big area up in the north, which I haven't really yet had a time to really get my head around. But I can't see that it would be any different. I think just the thing that happens is there's different parts of the country, obviously, will be a different part of the year. So you may not expect, uh, you'd expect the same drivers, but it's going to be you might have to handle it a little bit differently so that's interesting <laughs> and of course we've got we've got variety in there so we've got three or four varieties um the location is quite important 
Um, and we are trying things like we're using statistical models, as I've obviously uh, made a big underlying highlight of, but we're also maybe looking at some mixed effects models uh, to get some of those random sides of things like the, you know, block centers and things, which really, they're, they're sort of, they can have more of the confounding effects. If you get a really good farmer, if they're, if they're using, um, you know, a farmer that's uh, particularly good or maybe a farmer that for some reason wasn't able to get on top of the harvesting as well those things can make a big difference the other thing that they've got this ad hoc risks if you like some abiotic factors like such as pests or diseases they will come in the model doesn't predict for those and it probably never could you've got to have the agronomist on on hand to watch for those things and i guess the other thing is the biotic stress one i think we are going to be able to really look for is those high temperature stresses in pod fill which is over about 27, 28 degrees C. If you get any hours over that, it does reduce pod fill or hail damage, which again, we can't really predict. We might just, um, that, that's more of an ad hoc risk. And just, I mean, that one to three days harvest window that you're, that you're sort of landing, to, landing on, um, uh, I, my understanding is quite impressive. Can you just explain to everyone the growing cycle? Like how long, do beans take from you know planting to harvest and, and therefore how, how important is that window in getting yeah well that, that's another good question now thank thanks david uh it first i didn't say much about the crop and, and as i said it wasn't i haven't had a chance to uh ask my gary about using specifics but really the, the green bean crop is a short statured crop it's um I don't have the, the in my head because I was being a statistician. I always think of you know confidence intervals rather than absolutes. But it has a growing you know season, uh, and when it's um, when it's producing its pods, when it's flowered and it's producing its pods, it's quite a short growing season for those pods because it's mechanically harvested, of course. And and when you when you want to mechanically harvest, you want those pods to all be at the same. Uh, level of maturity and the same level of quality so um, when they come through the, the quality is high uh, and again one of the things I noticed one of the things I noticed when I started this project is you go and look out in the literature for what's what's been done about green beans and there's not as much as you might expect in the literature and I think that's because it's um, a high value vegetable crop um, and you're actually harvesting it mostly when you're looking at pulses and beans you're harvesting when you've got beans in pots but this is different you're harvesting at quite a specific time um, for the quality okay i don't know if that helps david <laughs> no it does indeed thank you and and i guess that the questions i'll notice anyway that the, the eureka and gnarly which you headed off anyway i, I listed down here that you you considered one of the important re revealing moments too was when you're in a position to be able to link the context of decisions and the data right you had a really nice I grab on that. The, yeah. the gnarly, um, again, I'm inferring that whole grind of making sure the data is in good condition to be worked upon, yeah. that the data is full and free and accessible. Yeah. Um, what's your advice for, I mean, what's your advice for, for all of us in the field, knowing that you're at Ground Zero working that three-way connection between the research, the dreamers, the doers and the dollars? So <laughs> what's your advice? Well, I'd, I'd really like us to, um, I think people don't necessarily value data as an asset as much as they should. I've always valued my data because I spent, like behind me is my Land Rover in Africa. And I spent a lot of miles going around collecting data and it's a lot of effort. It's a lot of sweat and tears getting the data. So we need to value our data. And I think one of the things we find working with pe other people, you know, you've got producers, they use their data for a particular purpose. We want it really clean and tidy and well-defined to put in our models so that we can spend a lot of time on the modeling and less time on the cleaning. But when you come to, together, and I think any statistician or data person will say that one of the biggest challenges is for the getting together um, the data uh, for the appropriate um, that sort of model but what I would say is you always always never never do not you always need like a data dictionary okay what's that variable and you can say you know this is site and this is that it needs to be really clearly defined and even for things like varieties you know it might be spelt wrong in one it's, and then dates I didn't mention in my but dates can be very problematic and then if you're going from a place that's got a, American dates because it's set up in American sort of software going into you know you've got a lot of, you, when I say date format it's things like you know month year 
day or whatever. Those things can really throw you out. When you're working with something like R or Python, there are some really nice packages that help you with that, but it's a hell of a lot of extra work to get them massaged into position. So the whole thing is about love your data and love the time that you have to talk and communicate about it and get it ready, because it's important. <laughs> Thank you, Miranda. On behalf of us all, thank you and the project team or all our partners for, for a really insightful presentation. Great. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.